So, hello everyone. Um, I'm using a particular novel as a case study, really to talk about gender stereotypes in archaeology and how they affect us as a field, and also how, in terms of how we interpret the past. Um, just kind of a quick content warning as well. I do sort of briefly mention sexual harassment, and I thought I should mention that before starting. So, uh, the power was written by Professor Naomi Alderman. It came out last year, and the basic premise is that young women gain the power to electrocute at will. Um, yeah, <laughs> pretty shocking. <yeah>. And um, <laughs> nice. Whoops. Anyway, <laughs> and the novel kind of follows um, various different characters across the world and how this phenomenon affects them. Um, basically, what happens is women become the dominant gender in this book. It's kind of sort of a thought experiment about what would happen and also actually, interestingly enough, what the material remains of that would be. Um, as an archaeologist, what I found really interesting about this book is it's actually framed as a historical novel. Um, basically, um, that it's supposed to be written by a man thousands of years after this kind of um, whole kind of phenomenon happens. Um, and it starts off with him writing to Naomi. He's called Neil Adam Arman, which is an anagram of her name. Um, and he's saying, this is a sort of novelization of what archaeologists agree is the most plausible narrative. So it's interesting, the book itself kind of acknowledges that um, archaeologists create narratives and that this is only kind of one impression of what may have happened in this kind of alternative universe. Um, and particularly interesting is the fact that within the book, um, sort of fictional archival documents are referenced and included and also digital um, documents as well and fictional but also non-fictional archaeological artifacts are included in it um, with particular illustrations um, so in her acknowledgements for the book Alderman says despite the lack of context the archaeologists who unearthed them called the soapstone head illustrated on page 314 a priest king, while they named the bronze female figure on page 214 a dancing girl. But Alderman reimagines these figures um, kind of completely differently. She calls um, the priest king a serving boy and the dancing girl a priestess queen, so she's kind of inverting those interpretations. And this really illustrates how powerful established narratives can be in guiding interpretations of the past. Um, and it also shows how artifacts can be used as props to add legitimacy, legitimacy to a story, um, including um, a fictional story like this one. And I actually kind of, I was pretty unsettled in a way, actually, by real non-fictional artifacts being used in this way um, in a science fiction novel because there is this kind of blurring between what's real and what's not. We, these really are archaeological artefacts um, but she's kind of interpreted them in her own way and taken them out of context and in terms of what we've been talking about in this session that's particularly interesting to be talking about things taken out of context out of their original kind of temporal context so um, and looking at kind of the wider context of where these artifacts come from, uh, the Indus Valley civilization. Um, this covered a broad, re broad region, including what is now Pakistan, um, also Western and Northern India. Um, can be characterized by large urban centers, such as um, Mahenjo Daro, which was where those two figurines came from originally. Um, and when uh, Mahenjo Dara was originally excavated by um, John Marshall in the 1920s, he interpreted the female figurines that he found there as evidence of a pre Hindu mother goddess. However, this is later now um, being kind of criticised um, and challenged. Um, for example, he used implicit characteristics such as an absence of male genitalia to sex the figurines. And he also just threw away fragmentary figurines. He didn't bother with those. Um, and uh, Clark has pointed out this has led to an identification of twice as many female as male figurines during the initial excavation at Harappa, which is another kind of urban centre from Indus Valley civilization. Um, 
so it's again it's it's really interesting that she's taken these two artifacts that have this particular kind of history in terms of how they've been interpreted by archaeologists um, with their own particular agendas and particular ideas about gender in the past um, there is no evidence to suggest that that statue is really a priest um, and furthermore most of the figurines that have been found from in this valley civilization are found in secondary contexts such as domestic trash and Sinopoli has pointed to this as well as the variability of the greens. You know, they're not a homogenous kind of group. There's evidence that an idea of a monolithic mother goddess cult does not stand up to scrutiny. As archaeologists, we are world builders. Um, we use material remains in the present to try and build an impression of the past. And the legacy of previous archaeologists as world builders also affects the narratives that we construct ourselves, whether consciously or otherwise. Um, at the end of the power, um, the author of the book um, is basically is trying to convince her that things before weren't like how they are now in their kind of society, that women weren't always dominant. And he writes to her saying, the way we think about our past informs what we think is possible today. Um, I think that's just generally very relevant to this session and it kind of it also works the other way if we can't imagine a society without the present structural inequalities that we live with then it's very hard to theorize a past that isn't the same um, so given kind of the particular focus of this presentation I wanted to talk just a little bit about um, the semantics of sex and gender and individuals assigned sex may not reflect their gender identity or expression um, and this seems very pertinent considering sort of how things like the greens uh, are sexed by archaeologists try to identify whether they're male or female um, gender identity is not static it's not a binary opposition <coughs> can change over time and as Clark has very rightly pointed out in any ancient civilization sex gender and sexuality may have been viewed completely differently um, I would argue that the power does not really engage with its own biological determinism. Um, there's just kind of that overall premise that all women kind of eventually gain this power and it's sort of physically manifest manifested through um, this scheme, this kind of like organ um, that they get, which allows them to electrocute at will. But um, it doesn't really deal with the fact that people in that society, presumably not everyone who would have had this power would have necessarily identified as being a woman, for example. Um, there is one kind of limited reference um, to one character who has a chromosomal irregularity um, and so he does have that power. But that's about it. And I think that would have been something really interesting to kind of explore within the novel and that's something maybe that archaeologists I think could kind of look into more. Um, so the title of my pre presentation was The Female Future of the Past, which I kind of feel, felt was a kind of big generalisation really. Obviously women are not a homogenous group and also women, as everyone does, faces um, and sort of, well they have different life experiences based on many different factors including, but not limited to, race, class, sexual orientation. Um, and this is why some people have actually kind of started to look at um, an archaeology of life cycles as a way of trying to consider different these different factors simultaneously and how those might change through someone's life. Um, so what about women in archaeology? Doug Rocks McQueen um, has written about the results of the Profiling the Profession survey, which was done in 2012-2013. Um, I included this screenshot of his blog because I just really love that title and it seems really relevant um, to this presentation. Um, um, Doug discusses the data and show, which shows that younger generations of archaeologists tend to include a greater ratio of those who identify as women compared to older generations. Um, and also in a more recent blog post in March of this year, uh, he wrote about this entails that there are more men in senior positions in the UK in archaeology. 
um, therefore they tend to get paid more. But we may see this changing over time. The question is, will we? Um, is there a glass ceiling in archaeology? Um, and what does this mean for archaeology as a profession if it does come to be more characterised by women practitioners? <laughs> Um, I kind of felt that I couldn't really talk about this topic without mentioning the Me Too movement, which came to particular prominence on social media in October of this year, in which um, many people, men and women, um, denounced sexual harassment and assault um, and came forward to speak about their experiences. Sexual harassment is an ongoing problem in all fields, including archaeology. Um, and there has been some kind of research done into this. Um, interviews conducted as part of research into fieldwork experiences and the implications for career trajectory uh, published this year um, found that variability and clarity of appropriate professional behaviour rules at field sites and access to professional resources um, were two main themes that really came up in terms of things that affected a person's career trajectory. And as long as there is sexual harassment, which particularly affects a younger generation of female archaeologists, Archaeology cannot be considered a field with gender parity, as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, The Power is set up as uh, a dysto uh, dystopic novel. Um, it's a thought experiment of what would happen if women had a very distinct um, advantage over men and what the material were made of that look like. Um, visions of matriarchal society have often tended towards kind of one extreme or the other as kind of a utopia or a dystopia. And the idea that a society um, ruled by women would be inherently peaceful is very stereotypical. Um, but I feel like the power kind of goes the other way. It completely, it goes to an, a whole other extreme. And um, I think that is also kind of problematic. It's interesting to wonder not just what would a female future of archaeology would be, but what would a more intersectional intersectional archaeology look like? And also to ask what kind of a future do we want for archaeology? Thank you.